All right, let's go ahead and get started here. Now, I'm going to be talking through a couple of the different modules that are here inside Perfect Photo Suite 8. Because this webinar is only about 45 to 50 minutes long, um, it is really hard to cram, cram in eight different modules. So there may be one or two that we don't necessarily get to today because a lot of it I want to cover is I want to make sure that you guys understand how to work with your files, bring them into the software, how to use them with multiple different applications. So there are a lot of basics that I want to cover today. First, I want to introduce you guys to how to use the program as a standalone. This is one of the best ways to use Perfect Photo Suite 8, and a lot of people don't know that they can actually open it up like any other application on their computer. So I actually have Perfect Photo Suite 8 logged in my dock right here, and I just click it, it opens up, and it brings me here into Perfect Browse. Browse is our browsing program. It's a way for you to find your images quickly and easily, which is really nice. It's very fast, very easy to use. You'll find that on the left-hand side, there's something called the Sources pane. This is where you're going to find all of the sources for your images. So things like online storage services like Dropbox, your iCloud Photo Stream, any portable hard drives, network drives that you may have logged into your computer. So if you keep a lot of your images in an external hard drive, I know that I do. I keep them plugged in so that I can access them. And then you'll also find a whole bunch of basic folders here, things like your desktop and your pictures folder. So this is where you're going to start trying to find the images that you want to have access to. You can actually add your own favorites by going up to the top right hand corner of the sources pane and clicking on the plus button. And you can go through and select one of your favorite folders to place in here, which is really nice. Anytime, I'm going to go through and I'm going to click up on one of my hard drives here. Anytime that you click on a hard drive or a folder that has many other folders nested in it, you're also going to see the folders pane pop up. This is a folder tree and it gives you access to very quickly finding the folders and images that you need to have access to. So instead of going through and double clicking on a folder and then double clicking on another folder and doing this whole kind of long game, I can jump over to the folders pane and I'm going to click open the demo images folder. You'll see all of the folders nested in that. I can click on one of those and these are all of the images that are now inside that folder. So this can also be a very good way to navigate through what you're looking for. All right, so when you're ready to actually take an image into the photo suite, you can actually, we're going to start out, and I want to introduce you to a layered-based workflow. So we're going to be going into perfect layers, and we want to be combining these two images. But first, I want to show you, if you double-click your image, it zooms in for you, so you can take a closer look. You can use the left and right arrow keys to move through your library of images, which is really helpful. And then also, anytime you have a photo selected, up in the top left-hand corner, the info pane is going to pop up. And that's all of the information that comes along with this image. So things like the camera it was taken on, the file type, when it was taken, things like the f-stop or the shutter speed, or any, any of that information, all that metadata is kind of put into that info pane. So anytime you've got a photo selected and you're getting ready to edit it, you can always take a look at that information if you need it. So once I've got my photo selected, you'll see up in the top right hand corner, I can go through and I can choose which program I'd like to go into next. So I've started here in Browse, I've found the image I want. When I'm ready to click on another module and go into that, I can go ahead and just click once. It's going to ask me whether I'd like to edit my original file or edit a copy of my original file. I also have things like the copy options. So what type of file format am I interested in? What type of file format am I interested in using? So if I'm creating a copy of this, this original image is a JPEG. It's not going to give me access to a layered based workflow. So I'm going to, I'm going to edit a copy and I'm going to make sure that it's a Photoshop file that will give me access to layers so that I can combine multiple images together. 
I can change things like color space if I need to be very specific about what that color space is going to be. I have this nice menu of options. I can change things like the bit depth and I can type in a new resolution if I want to. So tons and tons of options. Now once I'm ready, I've got my copy all set. I'll go ahead and click OK and then it'll transfer me over into layers. Now you'll notice that here inside Perfect Layers, on the right hand side, there's something called the layer stack. This is where you stack multiple images together to do things like combine two photos of different exposures, which is what we're going to do, or create some sort of photo collage where you've got two images kind of nested together, or lots and lots and lots of ways that you can use layers. It's a great program. But you'll see that I only have one photo in here. There's only one image. It's, it's the photo that was exposed for the sky. And the bottom half of this image is really dark. It's very dull. There isn't a lot of information here. So I have a sky, but I don't have, I don't have any water. What we need to do is open up another image and place it on top of this one. Now we can jump back into Perfect Browse and we can go through and do that if we like. But here in Layers, there's actually an easier way to access your images. It's called the Files tab. It's on the left-hand side of your screen. And you can actually access tons of different files on your computer so that instead of having to go back and forth between browse and layers as you're trying to find the images you're going to combine, you can just find them here. Right up at the top left-hand corner, this is going to be something called the folder tree. This is where you'll, you'll get access to the folder that you need to, you need to use for your images. So I'm already in that folder. It's the on one samples. And these are all photos that actually come with Perfect Photo Suite 8 when you get it, which is really nice. So these are good practice images that you can play around with. And you'll see <clears throat> there is the sky image that we just went through and opened. And then right next to it is the water image. And this is the one that you can tell it's kind of overexposed, but the, the water in the photo looks good. The sky is a little blown out. So we're combining these two images. Now when I'm ready to open this photo, I'll just double click and it's going to open up that same dialog box that we just saw. Now there's one last option here down at the bottom that we didn't talk about. It's called add as a layer. What we want to do is not open this image separately and edit it separately. We want to add it as a layer in our layer stack. So when I select that option, those copy options disappear because it's going to pull information from the, the original photo that we're working on. And we'll go ahead and click OK. Now, on the right hand side in my layer stack, you should see two different photos. On top is the image that's exposed for the water. And then beneath it, the one that we can't quite see, is the one exposed for the sky. You can turn layers on and off by clicking these little eye icons so we can see Underneath is the sky photo, and then on top is the water photo. Now, when you're ready to combine these images together, we actually have two different masking tools that you can use, but we're going we're gonna to use something called the masking bug. And this is a gradient-based mask, which can be very useful in situations like this, where you've got a pretty much straight, straight across the image horizon line there. So we'll go ahead and select that tool. And up in the tool options bar, before, we, before we're adding the mask or anything like that, there's something called the Shapes drop-down menu. We'll open that up. You get these nice little visual representations of what the mask is going to do and what it really is. So right here at the top, this is going to be the one that we're using. It's called Linear Top. And you'll see in that little tiny icon, there's white on the bottom and black on the top. What that means is that this water layer that we're looking at right now, the bottom part that looks like it's white, that means we're going to save all that information on this water image. We're going to save how good that water looks. The black section on the top of that little icon indicates that we're going to hide that overexposed sky. So it's white is revealing the layer that we're looking at, black is concealing. The layer that we're looking at and that's exactly what we want to do right now so i'm going to go ahead and select that option and it will automatically place my mask right in the center of my image 
we've removed that overexposed sky and we've revealed the great kind of darker, moodier one underneath. Now the masking bug is very easy to use and to adjust. There's a circle right in the center that you can click and use to drag around. And as I do so, you'll see that it's changing where that mask is. I can rotate the bug by clicking on this little button on the right hand side. It looks a little bit like a compass. And I can move that around if it's not quite in place. And then the dotted lines on the top and the bottom indicate a feathering amount. Right now, there's a pretty soft edge between the bottom of the image and the top of the image. If I take these dotted lines and I click and drag them closer to the center, you'll see that all of a sudden, there's now a straight line between the top of the photo and the bottom, and it looks really bad. But as I slowly start to drag it out, it adds a soft feathering to the edge there and creates a little bit more of a natural look so the image doesn't look quite so disjointed there in the middle. So you wanna make sure, especially when you're working on images like this one where you've got a top and a bottom, you get that nice soft gradient so that it flows together really well. Now, once we're pretty much done, on the right-hand side in the layer stack, you're gonna see that the mask pops up. You don't need to go through and add masks, delete masks. They're technically automatically attached to your layers in your layer stack. So there's no, there's no adding necessary. All you have to do is select your masking bug, edit that bug, and go through and play around with it. You don't have to go in and do anything in your layer stack. When I'm done, on the bottom right-hand corner, I can go through and click the Save button, and we can save this image. It's going to go through and save it as a new PSD file so that we can have access to it. And then if I want to, I can continue my editing-based workflow, and I could take this image into other applications if I'd like to. Before I do that, the most important thing I need to do is create a unified layer. Right now, we have two separate layers, one for the water, one for the sky, and we can't edit, we can't edit them together yet. It's not a unified image. They're still separated. So there's a tool up in the layer drop-down menu at the top of your screen, and it's something called New Stamped Layer. When I select that option, what it does is it takes both of those combined layers and smushes them together and creates one new unified layer on top. It's merging everything below and it's creating a new editable layer. So now I can take this final image into another program and I can add a really cool black and white effect, for example. It's very easy to jump around different programs here, so all I would need to do is just click on any of the modules I want to jump into, and I can continue my editing process. So we're going to go ahead and save this, and we're going to go ahead and close it. You'll see on the left-hand side of my screen in the Files tab, there is the sky and the water images right on top, and then right in between them, is our brand new combination image, which is a PSD. And it's taken both of those photos and combined them together. So that's the image that we just created. And it's automatically popped up here in the folder where I got my original images. Very, very, very easy. Now, using the program as a standalone is great, but I'm suspecting some of you guys have other applications. So I wanna make sure that I go through and introduce you to how to take images from things like Aperture, Lightroom, Photoshop, and bring them into the perfect photo suite. So we'll start out here in Aperture. And Aperture is a great program, and there are lots of different tools in here that you can utilize to adjust your images. And I want to introduce you to a program called Perfect Enhance. It's one of our new ones with Perfect Photo Suite 8. It came out at the end of last year, and it's a really, really great starting point for your photos because it combines a lot of really needed tools in one place. So when you've got your image all ready and you want to take it into, you want to take it into the Perfect Photo Suite, there are two different ways that you can access the program. The first is by control clicking or right clicking on your image and going to edit with plugin. And from there, you're gonna see 
all of the different modules. You're going to see Perfect Photo Suite 8 as a whole, which is really useful. So you can go through and do a multi-based, multi-module based editing workflow. This exact same menu can also be found in the Photos menu at the top of your screen when you scroll down to Edit with Plugin. It's I promise it's the exact same thing. There's no difference between those two menus. They're just in a slightly different place. So when I'm ready to take my image into Perfect Photo Suite 8, I'll just go ahead and choose whichever module I want to go into. It's going to take my image and it's going to pop it over for me. Now, Enhance is a really, really basic program. It's very easy to use, but it's got a lot of really potent tools. On the right hand side of the screen, you're going to start out in something called the Quick Fixes pane. These are all basic adjustments that you can make on your images, and they're usually really good starting points. So things like automatically adjusting the levels or the whites and the blacks of your image. This is a good place to start, especially when you have a photo like this one that's it's pretty dull. It's very flat. So when I click on Auto Levels, it will brighten up the photo, but you'll see that it maintains some of those darker shadows so that we have a nice contrast in our image. There's also the auto color button. And this will try and automatically adjust the color in your image. We can go ahead and click on it, and you'll see it's trying to remove some of that bluish hue. Although I was in this situation and um, I know that the walls were pretty blue, so I'm just going to go ahead and turn that auto color off and leave it with that nice kind of cooler tone. And then down below both of those auto options, you also have six buttons for basic adjustments, things like adjusting brightness just by clicking the plus or minus buttons, adding or subtracting contrast, vibrance. You can adjust the temperature so I can make it warmer or I can make it cooler depending on what I'd like. I can increase detail, which will go through and add contrast to all of those little tiny fine details in the image, which is really good for kind of crisping up a grungier photo. And then last, I can add a vignette if I'd like to. Very basic vignette, no adjustments, just very simple. Now, these are quick fixes for a reason. They're very simple buttons. You just click, you adjust your photos. There aren't a lot of manual adjustments involved. If you're more interested in the manual adjustments, click and open up the color and tone adjustments pane. Once you do so, you'll see that many of the options that we were looking at above are here, except that you now have sliders, not just plus and minus buttons, but you have actual sliders that you can go through and you can click or drag. You also have a couple ones that you didn't necessarily have before, like shadow and highlight recovery. So if I need to recover some of my highlights or if I need to recover some of my highlights or shadows, I can do that. You'll also see you have manual whites and black sliders. So if I want to make the whites even brighter or I want to make the blacks even darker, I can go through and adjust those. You've got your detail slider here, so you can really punch up some of that detail if you want that grungy look. And then you have your color section. So just in case the auto color didn't work, you need to manually adjust it, you can do that. And then you also have a white balance tool. So you can click on some sort of neutral point in your image and it will auto white balance for you. Also below the color and tone adjustments, you have a vignette and a sharpening pane. If you'd like to, we've got some really, really basic adjustments, things like if you're prepping your image for print, this is a general sharpening to get your images ready to be printed out. So I could select that option. And then if I know that I'm looking for a very subtle basic vignette, I can just click on the subtle vignette option. You still have advanced options if you'd like them. I won't go through all of them because there are quite a few, but just in case you want to have a little bit more control and you don't want to access any of these presets, you can open up any of the advanced options and go through and change things like presets. You can adjust any of the sliders in here and so on. And one of the reasons why Enhance is such a great tool, especially for starting out, is because you also have retouching tools in here. It's all kind of a one-stop shop for your, your basic introductory editing. On the left-hand side of your preview, you're going to find you've got a couple of different tools, things like your red-eye removal tool. Then we've got our crop tool if you need to crop it down. And then the two most important are going to be your retouch brush and your perfect eraser. 
We're not going to use the retouch brush. That's more of a what I find as a softer editing tool. So adjusting things like skin or sky, like removing a bird from like a sky gradient or nothing that has any texture or grunge. That's when the perfect eraser comes in handy. This is what we're going to use for, for an image like this, where you have a lot of detail, a lot of grunginess, a lot of lines that we want to make sure we reproduce. So we'll select that tool. And it's very, very simple to use. All you do is just click and drag over an area that you'd like to remove. So there's this little kind of paint chip that's over on the right hand side here. And I just want to click and drag to remove that little spot. And it does a good job of trying to replicate that paint like texture. So don't have to worry about going in and trying to fix up any edges. It's also really great for using on areas that are straight lines because it works really hard to try and keep things like the wood panel lines that you're seeing intact. So we can click and drag across the image and it's gonna go through and it's gonna remove that. It did a really good job of keeping all of those wood panel lines together. And if there's another spot I need to go through and clean up, now I've got a much cleaner selection and it went through and I didn't have to do a lot of lining up by, by hand or by eye, which can be really frustrating because you're, you're going through and you're trying to line everything up and you're trying to make sure it doesn't look like it's repeated and, and so on. So the perfect eraser is great for all different types of situations and I can remove anything from this image that I really want to. Those are two pretty quick, very simple examples, but you can see that there's quite a bit of power and juice behind this tool. Now, once we're done here in Enhance, I'm going to go ahead and click Apply on the bottom right-hand corner. It's going to add all of these different enhancements or effects that we added to our photo, and then it's going to bring me back into Aperture. Now, once we're back in Aperture, I'm going to zoom out so we can see our entire library here. You'll see my original image is right next to my after image. So I don't need to go looking for it. It's going to be placed right next to that first photo that we opened up. So I can see the image that I started with, which is, I believe this is straight out of camera. I, I don't think I did anything to this image. So it's really flat. It's very boring. There is not a lot of life to this image. And then this is our after photo. We've got a lot more oomph, we've got a lot more detail, we edited out things that we didn't like, we added a quick vignette, and all of a sudden we took a very flat, very dull image and gave it a little bit more of, of an exciting look to it. If I want to, I could continue my editing process from here, or I could just leave my image and continue editing other photos through Aperture. All right, so that's kind of a quick overview of using Aperture. Let's go ahead and jump over, and I want to show you guys how to use Lightroom. Lightroom's a little bit of a different beast. Um, it, is, it is a very different program. Uh, Aperture and Lightroom have many similarities. It is a catalog-based system. It has things like printing manuals and the ability to do things like to make basic developments or adjustments to your image. But one of the things that Lightroom and Aperture both don't have access to is a layered-based workflow. And in the last kind of little tutorial there, I showed you guys how to take an image and uh, bring it into a program like Enhance, which makes perfect sense. But what if you start out in Lightroom and you want to access a layer-based workflow? It's actually very easy. All you need to do is select multiple different images. So I have these three photos. Let's say I want to combine these pair of this pair of boots. And I want to combine it with this texture, this like concrete style texture. I'm going to select both of those photos right there, go up to the file menu and scroll down to plugin extras. The plugin extras menu is very similar to the one that we are looking at in Aperture. You're going to see lots of options in here, including perfect photo suite eight, which gives you the ability to access multiple modules at once. And then you'll also see that there are two different perfect layers options. One down at the bottom is open as layers and perfect layers eight, which means that these two photos will open up on the same image in a layer stack. If you go up and just choose the perfect layers eight option, 
it opens these photos in separate tabs, which give you the ability to actually edit them separately. So if I wanted to go in and make adjustments to the texture, make adjustments to the boots photo before I combine them together, I could go through and use that perfect layers eight option. So you have two different ways of going into the photo suite and kind of accessing that layered workflow, and you can choose which one's gonna work best for you. I'm gonna go down and just choose open as layers and perfect layers eight. It's gonna go through, it's gonna export my two photos, and then it's gonna bring me into the photo suite. Now, on the right-hand side, we were talking about the layer stack earlier. This is very similar. It's just we didn't have to combine the photos together. They've already been placed automatically, which is great. Just in case something is out of place here, so if the, for instance, the texture layer was in the wrong spot, you can just click and drag these layers into place. So it's very easy to move them around so that you can make sure that the photo you need on top is, is where it needs to be. For an image like this, where we're combining a texture with an underlying image, you'll want to make sure that texture is on the top. You, you don't want to, <clears throat> you don't want to have the texture on the bottom here. So I've got my texture. We can't see my photo underneath it. I need to change how it's blending into my photo. There's something here in the layers panel. It's called the blending drop-down menu. And this is different ways that we can take this overlay texture layer here and blend it in and combine it with the photo beneath it. Now there, there are tons of options in here. There's a lot of information and explaining blending modes can take quite a long time. Um, but what's wonderful is that you don't need to actually understand how a lot of these work in, in the long run. But when you hover your mouse over any of these different options, you get a preview of what they're going to look like on your photo, which is really cool. So you're not guesstimating like, I don't know what lighter color is, or I don't know what color Dodge is, but let's click and find out. I can just hover my mouse through until I find something that's going to work pretty well. I really like the overlay. That's one of my favorites. You get this high saturation, high contrast. You still keep the texture of the original texture image, but you still get a good look at the photo underneath it. And then soft light is like the more subtle version of overlay. These are the two that I use almost 100% of the time with textures. So once I've gone through and I've scrolled around and I've accessed all of these different really crazy options, I'm going to go through and choose the one I liked the most. And then right at the top of the layers panel is something called layer opacity. That's just how intense that layer, or for instance, this texture, is going to be on my image. Right now it's set to 100, so obviously it's really intense. But if I pull that layer opacity down, it's going to slowly soften that layer so that it's not quite so crazy. I do this quite a bit when I'm adding textures. I just drop the opacity down a little bit so it doesn't have quite that, that intensity. And it looks a little bit more subtle, a little bit softer. Now if I'd like to, we can do what we did before, where we go up to our layer menu and create that new stamped layer to continue our editing process, or we can just click save and leave. One of the things that I want to make sure I mention is up in the top right hand corner, you'll see that all of the different modules here, layers, enhance, portrait, effects, and so on, they're all white. All of those are technically available to me right now. So if I'd like to take this image into another program, I can do that, which is awesome. So just in case you want to do that, you can always access multiple modules from this situation. Now I'm gonna go ahead and click save because there isn't anything else I wanna do to that photo. That was perfect. We'll go ahead and close out and pop back over to Lightroom and we can go through and we can access our images here. Now, there are multiple different ways that we can go through and access the perfect photo suite. So I showed you how to get through that file plugin extras menu. And from here, I can access things like layers. I can access multiple different modules. However, what happens when you have an image where you don't want to access multiple modules? This photo here is 
another straight out of camera. It's a raw file. There's been nothing done to it, but I know all I want to do is just take it into effects. That's it. There doesn't need to be any black and white, no portrait, no masking, no layered based workflow, none of that. So if you control click or right click on your image, you get the edit in menu. This is kind of a condensed version. And uh, you, you're not going to see perfect layers or perfect mask, which are our layered based workflow programs. You're only going to see these plugin modules, black and white effects, enhance and so on. When I go through and we're going to we're going to bring this into perfect effects. When I choose this, it's going to ask me whether I'd like to edit a copy with Lightroom adjustments and you'll see that everything else has been grayed out. The perfect photo suite is not a raw processor. So because this is a raw file, I have to automatically edit a copy. So I can't edit my original raw image. It's going to stay here in Lightroom. I'm going to edit a copy of that photo. What's also really nice is if you make any adjustments in the develop module, which I know people who use Lightroom probably like to start in that develop module, uh, it'll save all those adjustments for you. And then down at the bottom, you can edit your copy file options. So just like we did when we were using the program as a standalone, I have adjustments I can make here like bit depth, resolution, color space, and file format. Now let's go ahead and click edit and it's going to transfer our image over into perfect effects. Now, once we're here inside perfect effects, we'll do kind of a quick overview of how to use it. On the left hand side, we have our filters library. These are all the different base filters that you can add to your images, like antique or vintage filters. We've got our texturizer. We've got our new sunshine filter. We've got our HDR look. We have things like borders and glows and grunge looks. And there are so many different filters in here. It's crazy. So you can start out pretty much anywhere. There are tons of different ways that you can go with this. When you find a category that you want to access, just go ahead and click once and it will show you filter presets that are specific to that filter. So I opened up something called the dynamic contrast category. And dynamic contrast is a way for you to add high intensity contrast to your image without halos and without, without global adjustments. It gives you more specific abilities to add contrast in certain areas. It's really useful. It's one of those tools that now I'm using all the time on specifically my landscape images. Now, when you're ready to place a filter that you really like on an image, so you've got all these little previews and I can find one that I think is gonna work best, I'm just gonna click once on that filter preset and it's going to add it to my photo. On the right hand side of my screen, there's something called the filter stack. This is almost identical to a layer stack. So you'll see I've got my original image down at the bottom and then right on top is my new dynamic contrast filter. You also have things like your layer opacity, which is very similar to your layer stack. So kind of treat this like a mini layer stack, if you will. Down below is the filter options pane. This is where you make adjustments to that specific filter if it doesn't quite work perfectly with your image. Sometimes when you're clicking on presets, you're looking at them and you're going, you know, this is good, but it's not it's not great. There's something else that I want to do here. And with all of these different filter options, you can really customize what that filter is going to do. And with the dynamic contrast filter, I'm going to go ahead and just zero everything out so we can start out looking at our original image. And I can give you kind of a basic workflow idea for what to do for, for images using dynamic contrast. So you'll want to start out by using the auto button. This will automatically improve the overall kind of general contrast in your image and make sure that your whites are nice and bright and your blacks are intense and it's not completely blown out, but you've got a little bit of like solid black in your photo. So I like to start out just by clicking that auto button so it will automatically adjust that global contrast for me. Now, if you need to, you still have manual adjustments here. So just in case, for instance, the blacks are too intense, I could move those over just a smidge. So you have the auto adjustment and you have the manual adjustment. Then right up above is the most important section. This is the detail adjustments. 
you'll see that they're separated down into three sliders. There's large, medium, and small, which means that there are large areas of contrast, small, fine, detail areas of contrast, and then all of the medium ones that fall in between. So when we start out, I like to start out with the large contrast. It's the most obvious, you can really see it happening. I'm gonna take that slider and I'm gonna move it over to the right. You'll see it's adding this contrast to these bigger areas like the trees on the left and the right hand side, but it's leaving all of these small little fine areas in the, the branches, this kind of foggy patch in the middle, all the texture that's on the ground. There's no contrast being added there. It's really honing in on all of these larger tree, tree trunks. The small contrast is gonna hit all these little tiny details. So as I move it over, you're gonna see this crispness happen in all of those little tiny, I'm moving it over really far so you guys can see it. I wouldn't go quite this far, but you can kind of see what's happening here where it's adding that contrast to all of those tiny, tiny, tiny twigs. The last slider is that medium contrast slider. And this is the one that's gonna fill in all of those spots that are still just a little hazy. So we'll go ahead and move that over and it adds contrast to the fog in the back area, some of these medium spots on the road, whole bunch of little areas that you wouldn't have even really noticed until you crisp them up and add that intensity. Once we've gone through and we've added detail, I can go back down and if I need to make other adjustments to things like blacks, if I wanna add just a couple more to get that deeper, darker, grungier look, that's good. And then there's also a vibrance slider at the bottom. This is the one that I like to use because I can pump up the vibrance in an image to make sure that any of the muted colors that happen when I'm adding this kind of tonal based contrast, they don't, they don't look dull. So the vibrance slider, I almost always move over just a little bit so that I can kind of pump up those colors. Now, once you've gone through and you've added a filter, there's actually a really great way to kind of check in and see how you're doing. I want to show you the before and after of our photo. Before we go back into, into Lightroom, let's take a look at our original image. There is a keyboard shortcut for showing your preview. It's Control or Command P on your keyboard. So this is straight out of camera. This is what we started with. Uh, this photo was taken in right outside of Portland, Oregon, which if you know anything about the Northwest, it's rainy and foggy and cold quite often. Uh, we don't get a lot of snow, but we get a ton of rain. Seattle and Portland are some of the rainiest cities in the United States. So we don't get a lot of sunny days. We get a lot of days that look like this. So I'm very used to having foggy, hazy photos. If you live somewhere like San Francisco, you probably know this too. This is our after image with dynamic contrast. The difference is huge. We took a photo that looks like it is soft. It doesn't have any definition in it. And we really pumped up that contrast in a way that isn't horrible. One of the things that drives me crazy is when people add something like tonal contrast and they get these horrible halos around the edges of their photo. It looks very fake because there's the vibrance or the vibrancy of the photo has been dulled. There isn't a lot of definition that's separating the smaller details and the larger details. It's just this kind of universal mess. And dynamic contrast is there to sort through that mess and help you figure out the areas that need more or less contrast. So you can take that dull flat image and you can really pump it up. Now when we're done here in effects, I'm just going to go down and click the apply button. It's going to go through and it's going to add this dynamic contrast and then it's going to bring me back into Lightroom. Now Lightroom uses something that it calls stacking where it stacks your original photo with your edited copy, which is useful. So I can take a look and see that there is my original and my after image. So this is the photo that we started with and then stacked with it is my after image that I edited in effects. So I have both of those photos together here so I don't need to worry about trying to figure out where they are and that's really useful. All right. Now, that's kind of a, a quick go through with Lightroom. The last thing that I want to introduce you to is Photoshop, and it'll be very quick. The first thing about Photoshop is up in the window menu underneath the extensions tab, 
you'll see that down at the bottom here, there's an on one option. If that isn't checked, you want to make sure you check it because it's actually a panel that's built here specifically for Photoshop that gives you access to certain modules. You can also access the photo suite by going up to the file menu and scrolling down to automate. You're going to see the exact same list in the automate menu as you are in that panel. Now there are really big differences between these two. And there's also a really big difference between how Photoshop works with the plugins and how the other programs do. Photoshop is a layered based workflow, which means that you won't have access to perfect browse and perfect layers the way that we did in the other programs. You can't take multiple images from Photoshop and bring them into perfect layers because you already have a layer stack here. So you're not going to see that perfect layers option pop up. The other thing is Photoshop has something called actions where it records all of the actions that you do on an image and then you can replicate those and place them on another photo. Actions are really useful. Most people who uh, who I think are big Photoshop users probably use actions on a regular basis. What a lot of people don't know is you can actually include the photo suite in your action in your actions. So if I create a black and white action here in Photoshop, I can actually include perfect black and white in that. Now what's important is that if you are going to utilize the actions, you have to go through the file menu down to automate. So if you're recording an action, you have to go to the automate menu and access from there or it will not work. So just in case you do that, just in case that's something you're interested in, it's always one of those little notes that can be really helpful if you're a big Photoshop user. Now, when you're ready to go into any of these different applications, you can click once and then right up at the top will be open perfect portrait eight. Underneath will be all of the presets that you can access. And presets are a way for you to kind of record your own style of actions inside of the photo suite. So it's ways for you to replicate things that you may have already done. I'm just going to click on open perfect portrait so that we can take this image into the portrait editing software. Now, one of the other things that's, that's also important to note about Photoshop is that it's not a multi-module based editing workflow. You're not going to see all of the programs right up at the top. You're not going to see them lit up. They're going to be grayed out, which means that I can only work here in portrait. I can't go into another module. So do remember that as you're working with Photoshop. It is just a plugin by plugin basis. Unlike when we were in Lightroom and we were combining those two photos together and you saw that we could jump into any other program, Photoshop doesn't work that way. So there are some limitations to working through Photoshop just because of the nature of the program itself. Now, super quick overview of Perfect Portrait here. It has face recognition, so it's already gone in and it's looked at this image and it said, all right, I found a face and it's placed a green rectangle around that. When I click inside that rectangle, it's going to zoom in and it's going to show me something called control points. And they're placed around the eyes, the lips, and the teeth. All of these different control points can be manually adjusted just by clicking and dragging so that you can make sure that they're in the right place. So you want to make sure that you've got all of the eyes, you've got all of the lips, and all of the teeth here. So I'm just clicking and dragging these until they're in place. When you're done and they're, they're finally in place, go up to the top right hand corner of your screen and click on hide controls. Now they still exist, but we don't have to stare at them while we're making excess edits. Once you've gone through and you've done your control points, on the right hand side, you have access to things like your skin retouching pane, which is where you're going to go and do smoothing on the skin. It's already added a little bit of smoothing, but maybe I want to move that over. I can go through and reduce shine so that those bright spots aren't quite so bright. I can edit things like the evenness of the skin tone, which will help flatten out some of those pinker or redder hues on the face. I can adjust color correction, which is based on skin tone instead of white point, which is really nice. So I can take this amount slider and just move it over to the right and you'll see it's removing that kind of weird greenish hue that's happening. I've got the eyes and mouth pane. So we've got things like adding white whitening to the eyes 
it's already added a little bit of whitening to the eyes as well as detail to the irises. I'm going to add a little bit more detail to the irises to make them pop out a bit more. It's added a little bit of whitening to the teeth already. I can pull that down if it's a little too kind of like she swallowed bleach. So I'll just move that over a little bit so it's not quite so bright. And then last, we've got the vibrance slider. And this will add vibrance to the lip color just to make those just to make those pinks and reds kind of stand out a bit more. Now, when you're when you're done with all of the options on the right hand side, you also can access our retouching tools. And this is where the retouch brush comes in handy. The one that we saw in Enhance that we didn't touch, the retouch brush is what works best when you're using it on skin. When you have it selected, all you need to do is just click and drag over the areas that you want to remove and it'll go through and get rid of them. What's really great about the retouch brush is that I can use it anywhere. It doesn't necessarily have to be on the face. If there's a blemish that's somewhere like her chest or her shoulder, I can click and use this anywhere. It doesn't have to be within that facial selection that we were working with. What's also really cool about the retouch brush and one of my favorite parts about using it is if you go up to the tool options bar at the top of your screen, take the opacity and lower it down to about 30 or so. Then take your brush tool and remove things like wrinkles and under eye circles. It softens and fades them out without completely removing them. We don't wanna get rid of her under eye circles completely because otherwise she's gonna look really fake. But if we soften them a little bit, she still has the definition underneath her eye, but again, she doesn't look like a doll. So I use this tool to kind of clean up some areas that are a little uneven or maybe have wrinkles or spots that we don't necessarily like. I go through and I just kind of soften them out a little bit. And I do this on most portraits and you can use it anywhere. You can use it for cleaning up areas of shine. That can be really useful. You can use it for softening, again, wrinkles or under eye circles anywhere in the face that you want to access it. And you can, again, you can use it across the board, but it works so well on areas of the face. Now, once I'm done here and I click apply, it's gonna go through and it's gonna add these effects and it's gonna bring me back into Photoshop. What's really great is you can actually see what this PSD file really looks like. I'll see right up at the top is the perfect portrait layer in my layers panel. These are all of the adjustments that we just made inside Perfect Portrait, and then underneath is my original image. And these work just like any other layer stack. I can use this layer and place a mask on it if I want to. I can access it in other ways using some of the Photoshop tools that I, I know I can use. I can continue editing, and I can take this image into another program. So let's say I wanted to take it into Perfect Black and White. I can go through and I can do that. The other really cool thing about Photoshop, if you're a big Photoshop user, is you can actually use smart, you can use smart filters and smart layers. Um, so if you have something called a smart object, you can utilize that inside Photoshop and you can access the idea of smart filters. They don't work with all of the programs, but they work with things like um, Perfect Effects, Perfect Enhance, Perfect Black and White, and so on. They won't work with programs like Perfect Mask, which is a masking-based program, and it doesn't really utilize smart smart filters the way that, that they're supposed to be used. Um, they require a lot of space, but they can be very useful. Now, one of the other things about this is, if you're not using a smart object, this layer, this Perfect Portrait layer, is not editable anymore. So if I click and take this back into Perfect Portrait, those adjustments that we made are set in stone with this layer. I can't go back and readjust the sliders, remove some of the retouching that I may have done, adjust the color correction. Those are, again, set in stone. That's when smart objects can be really useful, is they give you the ability to go back into the photo suite and re-edit if you like. While they take up a lot of space, that can be very useful if you're a big Photoshop person.